Greetings and salutations, friends! We have today an old but very relevant article for what is currently going on, which we're gonna have ourselves a little bit of a look at. I think this is an excellent preparatory piece for the kind of stuff we are going to be seeing a lot more of as 40k properly starts hitting the mainstream, except probably an even less charitable interpretation. So first of all, I would like to thank uh, Demon1234100 on Patreon for sending this to me. This is quite an interesting read. So, what I'm a 40k is not ready for Hollywood. Now this was written around about a year ago, pretty much exactly, but it is very relevant for what we are about to enter into in this period where 40k has, you know, it's got to deal with Marvel, it's got a TV show coming and so on. It is on the very doorstep of entry into the normie sphere, and when it does, I am pretty sure some interesting shit is going to happen. So I didn't know what kind of site this was to begin with, but then I noticed the Games Are Political tag which is always a good bloody sign. So I found an article from this year, November in fact, that basically says lots of <clears throat> liberals and Mexicans and women play 40k. <laughs> I'm sure that's true. But they're still the minority. Too many 40k fans are noxious and shitty, hence God Emperor Trump. So yeah, it's one of those sites, you know, the the orange man bad sites, the if you so much as think of Trump in a positive light, you're probably Satan, one of those sites. So now that we've set the scene, let's move on with it, shall we? So it starts by talking about how they were looking to, you know, broaden out 40k in, you know, television, live action, animations, and so on. Uh, that was a part of the plan, which they have also then clearly partially succeeded in with Marvel and the uh, Inquisitor TV show. And this, then we begin with something interesting, because D&D and magic were tied by parents, groups, and church leaders during the satanic panic of the 80s and 90s. Now, pretty much anyone in this day and age will realize that, you know, that there was nothing to that. That was nonsensical Christian bullshit from back when they were the moral authorities, instead of the, well, left-wing busybodies of today, essentially. But that was nothing inherently bad about either games. Uh, but there was nothing about the ends. They told typical stories about good versus evil. Hmm. That's a bit of an interesting view, because I don't know if I agree that D&D told typical stories of good versus evil, necessarily. Nor that magic did it either, really, but okay. Heroes versus villains. Again, I think that's a bit of an oversimplification. But 40k is different. That's when it gets really interesting. In the eye of many pop culture fans, 40k not only glorifies being the bad guy, it rationalizes fascism. Wow. <laughs> okay, right, okay, we're, we're getting right into it right away, are we? Now, first and foremost, a bit of a pet peeve of mine, which we'll get into a bit later, but I don't think you can call the Imperium fascist anymore. You'll mention this again, which well, I'll delve into it more then, but I think it's an overly simplistic way of calling it, because frankly, the word fascist means nothing in this day and age. Not, not just because we keep using it as basically a prerogative, uh, you know, as an insult on Twitter and so on, but also because if you just go to Wikipedia, just the, the Wikipedia page, the most basic, you know, normally source, you will find like 12 different definitions of fascism because nobody really seems to know. But again, we'll get a bit deeper into that. So glorifies being the bad guy. I don't think 40k does that. I really don't think it does. But now we're entering into the terms of good and evil as well, which just like fascists are terms that basically don't mean anything. Or well, in the terms of uh, good and evil, what it really means is it is something we find morally good or morally objectionable based upon the period that we find ourselves in. For example, if we go far enough back, then the Mexicans mentioned in the other thing, well, they viewed it as a moral good to sacrifice human beings. Because if they didn't, then the sun wouldn't rise in the morning, so obviously that was a good thing, right? Now, <laughs> we, <laughs> we might consider that a hint, Savage. You know? Things that used to be good are now evil. Things that used to be evil are now good. You know, these are just how the times and morality of humanity progresses. 
Sci-fi fans call 40k setting grim dark. In fact, 40k became the trope namer, namer, with its tagline in the grim darkness of the future there is only war. In the grim darkness of the far future, <coughs> excuse me, there's only war. The game was a child of 80s death metal sensibilities. Back then, miniature wargaming was a niche hobby. I, I, th <laughs> I think it still might be, but details. And it drew in a very weird type of hobbyists. This is also what we're going to see when this impacts, um, you know, normie culture. It's going to be like, oh yeah, this is a very niche thing. It attracts very strange people, poisoning the well, essentially. It was a small property that existed in a different social and political climate. It might be a bit too much for a general audience. Be a bit... Yeah, I don't know. It might be a bit too much for a general audience. And in a way... That is not incorrect, although, again, it exists in a different social and political climate. Well, I mean, that's not incorrect, but I don't think it's quite where he tries to lead this in relation to fascism and so on. But the idea that this might be a bit too much for a general audience, that is definitely a thing. Absolutely, which is why we're probably going to see more, well, like this articles in the future when it really becomes mainstream. Which is why this is such a great primer, because you can read this and you can develop the arguments beforehand, really. Consider the central character and the government he founded. What? He? What? Who? Like, oh, um, yeah, never mind. I read this once before, but my dyslexia <laughs> doesn't make it easier to read when it's a strange sentence structure. The God Emperor and the Imperium of Man. The Imperium is a fascist dictatorship steeped in religious fanaticism. Right, so there it is. Fascist dictatorship. It is not a fascist dictatorship. In fact, it is neither fascist nor a dictatorship. The only thing they've got right there is the religious fanaticism. Because think about it. First and foremost, fascist. Right, so I think that probably Benito Mussolini's best idea of this is, you know, take on this is our best fundament. Everything inside the state, nothing outside the state, everything for the state. Or I probably butchered that, but... The basic idea is the state controls... Everything, every facet of life is controlled by the state if the state chooses to do so. Excuse the noise. But if the state chooses to enter into your private life, it will do so. If the state chooses to privatize a business, it will do so. It will not necessarily do so, which differentiates it from, for example, communism, in which that was the end goal, that everything would essentially be nationalized. But the Imperium doesn't do that. There is a great deal of independence within the Imperium. Local planetary governors, uh, sector governors, sub-sector governors, religious leaders, and so on. There is a great deal of local freedom in how these planets um, govern themselves, how they worship, and so on. The Space Marines, for example, often have wildly different religious traditions to the officially sanctioned versions by the Adeptus um, uh, Ministorum. I, I was about to say Munitorum there, but it's like, no, no, M Ministorum. And it's also not a dictatorship. It is ruled over by a group of individuals, the High Lords of Terror and the Senatorum Imperialis, which contains tens of thousands of individuals. The closest we have to a dictator would be Imperial Imperial regent, probably, but even then, the power of an imperial regent does not stem from his position or from his uh, personality, his charisma, or his place within the political party. It stems because he is the living voice of the god emperor. And even the high lords, their power also stems from the god emperor. They are interpreting his will and rule in his stead. So it is not a dictatorship because it's a theocratic organization. If we were to assume that that, you know, um, if you, you know, get word from high up and above and that is how you govern, if that is a dictatorship, then I'm sorry, Pope, <laughs> but you're a fascist dictator. <laughs> so you see, that doesn't really work. In reality, the Imperium is far more, you know, it's not a perfect description, but a far more correct name for it would be a theocratic oligarchy in all due reality. So that's another thing. Steve, this is supposed to be the point of view faction in the game setting. Well, kind of, you know. In a lot of stories it is, but it doesn't have to be. The good guys. Oh no, absolutely. See, that's also a thing. 
When this hits the normie sphere, the outsiders will look at this on the very surface level. They'll be like, oh, the Imperium's humanity, right? Therefore, humanity are the good guys, right? They're the ones whom we mostly see it from. Therefore, they are good. No. Again, the ideas of good and evil are not really overly applicable to the 41st millennium, at least not our ideas of good and evil. In the 41st millennium, it is absolutely a moral good, a moral necessity for the Imperium to be an incredibly authoritarian government, because if it was not, it would not be able to function. It is too vast a galaxy to be governed via democratic means. You simply can't have like three million planets all voting on every little bit thing, or hell, even voting for representation in most cases, which is why the Senatorium Imperialis is made up of just tens of thousands of individuals instead of absolute millions. It simply wouldn't be feasible. And if the Imperium cannot function as a larger entity, it would be unable to defend itself from the myriad of hostile aliens that inhabit the galaxy. And so, in the Imperium, the question of being authoritarian is not a question about good or evil, it is a question about being alive or being dinner. It's that simple. And again, we can judge that as good or evil, but in the Imperium, that is merely a choice about, it's a practical choice about survival, basically. And so they are not the good guys. They are not good or evil, they simply exist in a world where such ideas mean virtually nothing, really. Hell, even the Eldar or the Tau are neither pure good nor evil. Hell, the Tyranids are not evil. They are a predatory space-born organism that travels the galaxy looking for food. It's a predator. We don't consider a lion to be evil now, do we? But again, now, moving on. On top of that, there's no rebellion resisting this regime. So, at first I was like, Ooh, what, mate? <laughs> there are thousands of rebellions in the Imperium. Hell, there's even a gene steal cult down there. But then, like, like in Star Wars, so what they mean is there is no clearly good guy faction rebelling against the evil of the Imperium. That's what they mean. There's no clear cut good guy fighting the evil guy. Basically, they are objecting to the fact that the 41st millennium is a morally ambiguous setting, rather than being just good and just evil. It doesn't make a value judgement on our modern day system, basically. Like in Star Wars, the Imperium is the most hellish dystopia in fiction, but it is presented as right. Again, that is such a normal interpretation. The Imperium is not right because it is fascist. The Imperium is right, quote unquote, because it is able to survive in a hostile galaxy in the only way it has been able to figure out how. And that isn't even right. That is merely survival. This is not a question about morality necessarily, although I would again argue that it is inherently moral for a species to wish to survive. And you're trying to pigeonhole 40k into far too restrictive of a moral setting, basically. Which leads us to the Emperor, who was whose image was co-opted by Gamergate dickbags. <sighs> they are not like you and me. Therefore, they must be evil. We must sound the drums of war. <laughs> See what I mean? Uh, it's just... Ugh. To them, the Emperor embodies real American ideals. What? Okay, that one I still don't understand. Like, really, the God Emperor embodies American ideals, does he? That is a, an interesting interpretation. <laughs> I, the Emperor, who is vehemently anti-religion. <laughs> ah, Jesus. Ah. They call Trump the God Emperor and paste his face on the character's armoured body. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you the real reason why they do it, because this too is... Oh, this is absolutely going to be something they bring up as well. Because to a lot of people in this day and age, unironically, Trump is the literal devil. And that is why God Emperor Trump exists. This is literally a way to rile you guys up. It's... 
it's like it's like when 4chan said that like, the OK hand symbol is a symbol of white supremacy, or when they made milk into a symbol of white supremacy. It is literally a way to rile you up. And it's also because Trump is just so unfathomably base that he kind of deserves it. I mean, this is the guy, okay, who launches a military operation that kills the leader of the Islamic State and then posts a picture of the dog <laughs> involved in the operation. Now, Muslims aren't overly fond of dogs. It's just... Uh, he, he, he's a crazy bastard. He's an absolute crazy bastard and a massive asshole, don't get me wrong, but I, at least, find it pretty funny. And that also is why God Emperor Trump is a thing, because, well, seeing the anger and the outrage, that, that too is pretty funny, I must admit. The game's first edition was so gonzo and over the top that it was considered a parody of sci-fi awesomeness. True. Like Starcraft meets a meta meta poc meta op I don't even, uh, never, I think I can try. But over the years, Games Workshop cleaned it up technically. Gone are the heavy metal trappings and ludicrous elements, 40k retains all the totalitarianism, xenophobia, and religious fundamentalism with none of the insanity that made it interesting. Now, I don't think that's correct. I don't think there was the crazy things that necessarily made 40k interesting. And I think that is um, represented in the fact that as 40k became more serious, more grim dark, and more internally consistent and realistic, it became more popular as well. I don't think at all that that was the thing that made it necessarily interesting. And retains all the totalitarianism, xenophobia, and religious fundamentalism. So, again, what you really mean is it retained all of the moral ambiguity. Because, again, totalitarianism is absolutely necessary in a galaxy spanning empire like the Imperium, where communication over intergalactic distances is incredibly difficult. You kind of have to be. A democracy will not function under those conditions. Xenophobia. Oh, absolutely. When you exist in a galaxy where the vast majority of aliens will try to rip your face off and eat you, <laughs> xenophobia is not so much a choice as it is a necessity to stay alive. And that is just as true for the Eldar and the Tau as it is for the Imperium. I mean, hell, the Tau have done better than most avoiding xenophobia, but they too have quickly realized that you can't talk to orcs, tyranids, or necrons and religious fundamentalism, which is of course an unavoidable aspect of 40k, seeing as, well, the Chaos Gods are real. If God was real, then religious fundamentalism in our world would probably take a step or two up as well, you know? Without weaponized electrical guitars and space limousines, the 40k universe isn't metal anymore, it's just mean. And again, just a moral judgement. Like, this person doesn't like it, therefore, the entire universe is mean. Hundreds of novels chronicle the fictional history of the 40k universe. Even if they rebooted the entire setting... There's still Wikipedia. <laughs> I, I love this one. It's like, even if we nuked everything, some of the cockroaches would still alive. <laughs> <laughs> mm. uh. Yeah, some of the lore would indeed exist even if you nuked everything. How unfortunate. And they all showcase one of 40k's very violent, very politically incorrect legacy. Yes, and God bless it for that. GW's kid-friendly worm adventures aren't going to help much. Oh, absolutely, because that just didn't work. As I fucking said, but hey, details. Arch being right is hardly a new thing. The brand is steeped in mega violence, suffering and institutional ignorance. Absolutely. And that is why we love it, because it's such a crazy setting. But there is still hope. If there's thing about a late night cartoon, none of this matters. A 40k show would fit perfectly alongside Rick and Morty and the Venture Brothers. I don't know if I entirely agree with that either. Although, whatever 40k, anime? Mmm, happy loyalist noises. Oh, absolutely, because the Japanese give no shits. They would go full ham on this, absolutely. Space Marine, the anime, <sighs> much happiness. 
especially if they embrace its insane roots. No, we're not there anymore. But you could, even with the orcs, you could do it with the orcs, I guess. Then it might fit in alongside Rick and Morty. But if they're shooting for a mainstream action cartoon or anything live action, GW has some serious retconning to do. Again, now, I don't agree with that. In fact, I think that is an insane idea. Because, okay, we'll actually move on a bit before we go into that. Or DW could embrace the dumbness of the setting if the Ember had text speech players turn the sheer stupidity of the setting into the, the joke. Well, it kind of already is the joke, you know. The joke is this is a horrible place to live. Th that is the joke. You don't want to live here. That is, you know, that's the joke. But... <sighs> Because he, and here comes the beautiful thing as well. Then again, the Emperor calls Gilliman a faggot in the first episode, maybe 40k is irredeemable. Because here's the thing. They're basically saying, GW has to surrender to us. They have to retcon. They have to go back to the politically correct, uh, to a more politically correct route. They have to get rid of the fascism, the mega violence and so on. They must surrender. And then he's like, here's an example of when they did kind of part of the thing we asked them. Excuse me. Here's the thing where they did kind of part of the thing we wanted them to do. And the next line is, then again, the Emperor calls Gilliman a faggot and maybe it's irredeemable. It's a perfect example of no matter how much you surrender to these people, it will never be enough. It is an entirely futile, it's, it's, just, it's pointless. It's not going to work. Marvel's done it. Movies done it. Games have done it. It has never worked, and it will never work. What's interesting is that 40k's equally bloody and satanic fantasy version, Age of Sigma, doesn't have the same stigma. Which again, Rin um, reveals just how normy the author is. Age of Sigma is an absolute baby compared to 40k, and it is a high, 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 high fantasy universe that has virtually nothing to do with 40k. And yet he is like, oh, it doesn't have the same stigma. Ah, imagine that, a completely different product isn't judged the same way. Mysterious indeed. It's probably because 40k is supposed to be the future. Oh, yeah, I don't think that's it, no. And it paints that future as a nightmare in which every bad thing humanity ever did is entrenched and institutionalized. No, it doesn't. It, it, it portrays necessity, that's what it does. As if the worst instincts of humanity are not only acceptable, but inevitable. It's basically the anti-Star Trek. Kind of. Star Trek is a massively overly optimistic universe. In unbelievably so. Unrealistically so. 40k is the exact opposite of that. It is a grim, dark, internally consistent universe that presents you a galaxy and then asks you how would humanity survive in this galaxy? And it doesn't moralize about it. It doesn't tell you who's good or right. It doesn't try to preach to you. It simply says, these are the circumstances. This is what appears to will happen in those circumstances. And so this is the world. Simple. So... Let's return to this a little bit. So, GW has some serious retconning to do in the respects to having it be mainstream. So, this is this is an argument you are going to see a lot. It's basically going to be GW wants to be popular, ergo they will have to change to become popular. But the obvious thing here is 40k already is popular. 40k is already this close to becoming a mainstream major thing. It's already a huge hobby. And it became that huge hobby, not by surrendering or modulating, moderating itself. It became that huge hobby by being 40k. And now we are supposed to believe that the only way to truly become popular is to just put a gun to our heads and blast out all of the things that actually made it popular in the first place. The gore, the action, the insanity of the setting, the brutality and the darkness of it. We need to remove that? The things that made the setting popular to make it popular? If you stop to think for a second, it is a truly absurd idea, is it not? But yeah, I'll add in an archive link to this article because you should definitely read this, because this will be an excellent primer for the articles that will virtually inevitably 
disappear, occur, and uh, in, in, in both of those words actually work, that will almost inevitably appear when the 40k Inquisitor TV show comes out. Assuming it isn't just a massive flop and nobody ever mentioned it ever again, in which case, well, <laughs> good, <laughs> I guess. But yeah, this is, this is the perfect primer for what it's going to be. I mean, this is written by somebody who basically pretends to be a part of the hobby. And it's like, oh, Arch, you're being a latest. Like, Wargamer 40k. Biggest property. GW's biggest property. Wargamer 40k is problematic. Do you think this motherfucker's a fan? <laughs> Call me an elitist all you bloody want, but the evidence seems to be rather obvious. So yeah, definitely do give this a read because it is just mwah, such a perfect example of what we're going to be seeing. And it's just fucking funny, isn't it? <laughs> Even if we nuked everything, a few cockroaches might still survive. I, I really enjoy that one. Until next time, I've been Arch. Thank you all very much for watching, and I hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day. <laughs> they would still be Wikipedia. <laughs>